she's a grafter. She means what she says, she knows what she wants and she gets it. These are some of Liz Truss's most supportive friends. Activists in her Norfolk constituency have nothing but praise for their MP, the next Prime Minister. The job is so important to her, getting done what she wants to get done. There's no um, airs and graces about Liz. She's just, as you see, she's got the skin of a rhinoceros when it comes to, to, to putting up with people having a go at her, I assure you. Several times over the years, colleagues have predicted that Liz Truss's career was on a downward path, that she'd soon be spending more time here in Norfolk than in Westminster. But friends say she's always been underestimated and her survival is evidence of a clever politician with a steely determination. Her political journey has taken her from a family she describes as left-wing, where she joined her parents in the campaign for unilateral nuclear disarmament, to Oxford University, where she was a Liberal Democrat and took to the conference stage to argue in favour of abolishing the monarchy. We Liberal Democrats believe in opportunity for all. We believe in fairness and common sense. After graduating, she joined the Conservatives, worked as an accountant and was selected to fight the safe Tory seat of South West Norfolk. But her political career was almost derailed when news emerged of an affair with an MP. She fought off attempts to oust her and was elected to Parliament in 2010. She was quickly promoted first to Education Minister. Those who worked with her back then say she was always across the detail. One of the things that successful teams need is someone who really believes in an idea, and Liz really believes in a lot of very big ideas. When I worked for her, we called her the Minister for Maths, and this was a real focal point. She can create a team uh, through her beliefs, through her passion, through her evan evangelism for important ideas. Her first cabinet job was Environment Secretary. It was obvious, though, that some work would be needed on her presentational skills. We import two-thirds of our cheese. That is a disgrace. Liz. When the Brexit referendum was called, she campaigned to stay in the EU, something she later said was wrong. Nicola Horlick, a Liberal Democrat, was part of that Remain team. For somebody to say, you know, I had this conviction about one thing and the next day, actually, I was wrong about that and I've now got a different conviction, when it seems that that's just about getting power, that really concerns me. You don't agree with Liz Truss on lots of things. Do you think she's got any qualities that would make her a decent Prime Minister? You've got this person who's very disciplined, very well organised, but is lacking on the communication and charisma side. But friends say she does know how to get her message across, and her Instagram posts show her playful side. Ruder colleagues think her love of a photo opportunity betrays a superficiality. She was certainly mocked for this regal pose last Christmas. Her promotion to Foreign Secretary has given her a global platform, something there are less than subtle echoes of Margaret Thatcher, a comparison she loves. Liz Truss will be Britain's third female Prime Minister. Life for her, her husband and two daughters is about to change and no one's underestimating the challenges that lie ahead. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's get more now on the huge economic challenges facing the new Prime Minister. I'm joined by our global trade correspondent, Dashini David. And of course, the economy is the thing that is of most concern to people here in the UK and for many right around the world. Uh, what are people going to be looking for from Liz Truss this week? I think uh, the answer is quite a lot because uh, you heard it there, you know, it's been a really hard fought battle, this leadership contest over recent months. But you might want to ask why on earth anyone wants the top job? Because yes, as you say, we're looking at global issues here, you know, soaring energy costs, food prices, a cost of living crisis that's driving a lot of economies uh, right into the slow lane. But when we look at the UK in particular, many are asking once again, is the UK the sick man of Europe? Because it looks like the UK is heading towards recession. We're already seeing the biggest drop in living standards in decades. And the answer is, how much, the question is rather, how much can Liz Truss do to actually alleviate that situation without damaging other parts of the economy? Because she went on a platform of big tax cuts 
in recent days there's been murmurings that we are going to see perhaps a cost of living package targeted more to alleviating the pain of those energy bills which are soaring over the winter months here in the UK. But what everyone is asking at the moment is how do you do that? Something which is going to add tens of billions of pounds possibly in terms of costs. How are we going to fund that and who picks up the tab for that? And what does that mean for government borrowing? What does that mean for their cost of borrowing? What does that mean for the UK's position and its image for international financial markets? Because the pound is already suffering. Could it take yet another dive? And could interest rates head still higher if taxes are going to come down? So lots of questions. And I don't think the answers are going to become apparent anytime soon. And there's a lot of reasons why international investors are nervous. And, and, and in terms of increasing the borrowing, which is what she's indicated, and it looks like that there will be a, perhaps a freeze on energy prices, and they said that's got to be paid for. Um, it, you know, what are the risks? What are the further risks to increasing the borrowing on such a massive scale with this, you know, talk of a hundred billion package? Yes, that is the talk. There's been you know, newspaper reports over the last few days that we could see a package of that size. Now, it's not clear we will. There are hints from her camp that we are seeing something of a U-turn and that will be uh, what she previously termed handouts, perhaps, to at least alleviate the extra pressure those at the bottom of the income scale are facing. Whether or not it's a whole scale package, we don't know. We don't know how much it could cost and we don't know how it would be funded. Is it something that perhaps the industry would have to pick up some of the tab for? Is it something, for example, that could be spread over a number of years and there could be some clever accounting tricks? But on the other hand, as you say, if we are looking at 100 billion pounds, that's, you know, over 100 billion dollars, uh, that is something that is going to mean some harder choices than we're already seeing. Are we going to see services in other areas coming to be cut back? Uh, does that mean the government's cost of borrowing is going to rise even further? It's rising very sharply at the moment because of high inflation, because of higher interest rates. It's already you know, adding tens of billions of pounds to the bills we thought we were going to see just a year ago when it comes to that cost of borrowing. Is that going to rise still further and give UK PLC a bigger headache further out? OK, Darshini David, thank you very much indeed.